Okay, I'm very, very excited to welcome uh, Mark Lai, uh, especially with his experience in the golf world, tour member for, what, 20 years, Mark? Uh, yeah, close. Channel, tour radio, Sirius Radio, which we'll get into your your uh, instances with them. But uh, thanks, for, thanks for making this time on such short notice. I think I reached out to you last Sunday, and, and here we are this week. Well, I... I like what you're doing. I like uh, the podcast with golf and uh, I like where you are, Hilton Head. I played in there of my 18 years on the on the tour, my two years of the international tours. I think I played in Hilton Head every year uh, that I was available uh, and I would make sure I was available for your event. Uh, I guess the guy's name is, uh, is it Steve Wilmot or Chris? Steve Wilmot. Steve yeah. Wilmot. I, he was one of the first ones I had on. He's the longest standing tour director which i think they might have modified his title now yeah uh on 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 the schedule so i think he's 30 years now yeah and michael stevens michael stevens was before him so uh i go back to 77 through 94 95 are my tour years and then Mm -hmm. i did 18 years for golf channel and uh, then i came around to the radio which is the best gig ever by the way (laughs) yeah yeah i'm well i'm liking this podcast thing because i'm I talk to who I want to, and we talk about what we want. And then I, I have one guy that does editing, which he hardly edits anything unless someone's got to take a break for the restroom or calls me and says, Hey, take this out. But his job is very simple in that we've hardly had to edit next to nothing. But, uh, but t- today's topic, I'm sure a lot of people will want to edit us or cancel us as, a, as they've done to you already. And we're going to talk a lot about live golf because that's a hot topic and then absolutely cancel culture in general and how that's, how that affected you negatively and how, how, most, I think the overwhelming majority of people in this country do not agree with it. And, and the, the very minute group is getting all the attention. But since it is a golf podcast, even though it's 360 and we talk about anything, let's jump into live um, because it's U.S. Open Week and it's been getting a lot of attention for obvious reasons, as you have the live players playing on the. We'll call it the PJ Tour or the U.S. Open this year. So what what have you seen and, and watched with Golf Channel Live and or uh, all the things that are out there right now? Well, you know, I watch a lot of TV and I watch a lot of golf. And uh, with, uh, you know, I've been involved in this game for so long. And what, what's really troubling to me is that this is a parking lot job. I mean, there's not any side uh, that that is saying that, that LIV golf is okay. Now, I've been watching a little bit of uh, uh, Fox News and all over the, the – the spectrum there with, uh, you know, Brian in the morning and, uh, uh, then Brett bear. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they're actually talking to Greg Norman and they're talking to players and they have a a line to them and they're, and I, I think what's so hard hitting the wrong way is that nobody is taking the side of the players on LIV and look, Ever since back in February, you know, I said, well, this thing is for real. You know, this, this, this isn't going to, huh? This isn't going to go happening. away. Yeah, this is going to happen. It's going through. So immediately I saw people posturing. I'm mean, from Golf Channel and Eamon Lynch and Brandel Chambly and, and all of these guys. I'm just saying, well, what the hell? Look, these guys know they would go for the money. That's why we played on the tour. Well, maybe not in my day because the money was awful. I think I made 22000 my first year on tour, and I was 100th on the money list. How about that? <laughs> 100th. So uh, we didn't do it for the money back then, but in the, in the Tiger era, and, you know, oh, my gosh, the money got so big. And then, uh, you know, so LIV fronted by, you know, I guess the Saudis, and I don't know anything about Saudi Arabia. That's one part of the world where I never had uh, the privilege of attending. Uh, you know, I played a lot in Europe and in Australia, and and I said, well, how how bad can this be? I mean, they're in other sports. They, I think, they own a couple of soccer teams or football mm-hmm. teams, as they call them in the UK. I think they own horses that the race in the the you know the the great races. Uh, they own teams. I, I just. I'm thinking they're getting into golf. And I think Lee West would kind of put it most succinct, the most succinct way I ever heard it. And uh, he was being asked a couple of months ago, he says, well, how do you feel about playing for the blood money of the Saudis? And so Lee Westwood said, hey, you know something? I played in this exact tournament uh, type of tournament run by the same guys two years ago. 
the one that uh, I guess Dustin Johnson won. And nobody called it blood money then. He said, now all of a sudden the narrative is it's all blood money. You can't do business with these people. Um, unfortunately for those people that are on that side and, and look, I'm on both sides. I'm just not on the side that is the hypocritical side. You can't have FedEx doing business, huge business in Saudi Arabia and being one of the major sponsors, if not one of the major sponsors in, in golf on the PGA Tour, FedEx Cup, FedEx St. Jude Tournament, now in the World Golf Championships, um, and other companies. They're doing business regularly and in a huge way in Saudi. One of the biggest bases for or uh, stop off points for FedEx is actually in Saudi Arabia. There are allies. No, I don't like everything they're doing, but I don't like everything China's doing. And yet these guys are wearing Nike shirts and, you know, wherever they're made. Uh, we have a PGA Tour China going on. So to me, it's, it's like, what? Pick your poison. Is it the Saudis are so bad we can't do anything with them? See, I think that the PGA Tour, and I, I thank the PGA Tour because I was a member. I still have my membership. You know, I have a money clip. I apply for, you know, membership every year because I'm a tournament winner and um, I'm a member. So I'm, I'm proud of what they've done for golf, but I'm not proud of them stonewalling and basically saying, Phil Mickelson, yeah, it's been a great 31 years. But, Phil, if you play in one event, one, you're canceled for life. And I'm thinking, well, where do you build up your capital? Where do you build up your loyalty? Is 31 years playing on the tour, six-time major championship, uh, playing weekly, making being one of our stars, uh, the tour promoting him as such, does that not build any time up at age 51? So I'm thinking, Phil, if you're offered $100 million, $150 million, hey, man, go do your thing, and we'll take you one. When you want to play, that would be fantastic. But I think the, I mean, here are the, here are the guys. I mean, Dustin Johnson, you know, cancel him forever. You want to pay, cancel Ricky Fowler now? <laughs> did, did Ricky make the jump? Ricky's made the jump. I, I checked on it this morning because I'd been hearing about it. And it, from what I've seen, there are about six or seven articles that saying he has officially made the jump. Um, so then Oosthuizen and Patrick Reed, DeChambeau, Kokrak, Graham McDowell. Now I want to tell you something. Graham McDowell is an outstanding human being. <clears throat> okay. This guy is one of the overachievers of all time, winning the U.S. Open at Pebble Beach, winning tournaments on the PGA Tour, winning tournaments in Europe, and a, just a good guy. In his middle 40s, he can be a – he can be entitled to play wherever the hell he wants, can't he? I mean, he's been playing for yeah. 25 years. So to me, I think it's an open open world as far as playing golf. You know, Tiger and Phil and DJ and all these guys and even Jack and Arnie in their day, they, they receive what's called, Pete, appearance money. Okay? Tiger would get uh, conservatively between 2 and $3 million every time he teed it up over there whether it be Abu Dhabi, Dubai. I don't know if he's ever played in Saudi, but these are the places that he would go and he would stack it up. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Fine. Nobody said anything until all of a sudden the amount of money became, ooh, this is real money. This is career changing money. This is, wow, in your 40s, if you're not super duper competitive, like, Adam Scott, still pretty doggone competitive, but he's done what he needs to do over here and why he's not going over there, over there for a hundred million. I don't know, but I look at Oosthuizen. I look at Westwood. I look at the Schwartz, Schwartzel. <laughs> May the Schwartz be with you. I mean, <laughs> look, he, I would say they're paying him at least 10 to 10 to 15 million. Plus, he gets to keep say, all yeah, of his prizes. He's a, he's a major. I wouldn't be surprised it was more because Perez just got $10 million and, and Pat's a tournament winner, but he's not a major winner. Correct. And So I would have to say Charles getting a lot more than $10 million. I would have to say that too, but I, I'm not speculating. I would, say, I would say that would be the bare minimum. And if I'm Charles at age six, you know, 36 or 37, he can still play 
I don't know when the, uh, the DP tour, which is used to be the European tour. I don't know when they're going to lay the hammer down. Do you have any idea? No, I haven't. I, I, the, the fact that they didn't lay anything down early on was got me interested. And then, you know, the, the latest I saw with all the posts, you know, the, the, if there's a good thing about social media, it brings things out right away. You don't have to wait for your six o'clock golf central to hear about new news, but that, uh, Commissioner Monahan and I don't remember the commissioner of the DP tour's name, but th th they were in some serious talks. So I'm sure that that is a very important piece in this game of chess between Liv and the PJ tour on whatever the DP comes up with, whether they grant membership to the Liv players or if they don't, that's going to have a, that's going to send this thing in, in a, a very important direction, in my opinion, lo looking from the outside. Well, I do know that uh, Dustin Johnson has applied for membership to the DP world tour. Okay. Makes sense. Patrick Reed, another one, and several players that have already played their one event or committed to play uh, next the next event, the LIV event in Portland, Oregon. You know, there are so many good venues out there, and I, I honestly think that the success of this LIV tour, I mean, first of all, it's basically a lost leader right now. And it reminds me of the times where they used to put golf balls in Kmart's and they'd sell them for exactly what they bought them for. K Kmart would, you know, it, if it costs them twelve ninety nine, uh, a dozen Titleists, that's what they would charge in the store. Mm -hmm. You know, to get them into the store and to get people, that's it. That's like their loss leader. So once you're in buying a a, a dozen Titleists at twelve ninety nine, which you could never do on a green grass place, mm -hmm. well, you know. Titleist had a little bit of a problem with that, but you know, they bought so many golf balls. What the hell? So I think that this is a lost leader and it's going to be a lost leader until this league is established. And what I see is that this will be the big league in golf. I know it's an outlandish statement, but when they have money, look a year ago, when this thing first got started, talked about and all this stuff, what was oil 40 bucks a barrel? Yeah, it was down in the tank. Everyone was trying to get rid of it. Right. It was they'd pay you to get take it off their hands, right? Mm hmm Well, so 40 bucks a barrel to now 120 bucks a barrel. And oh, by the way, that's what Saudi Arabia does. <laughs> they're, the pockets they're, go deep. They're basically playing on house money because of what they're charging us for a gallon of gas now or a bar barrel of oil. They've got sorry to say it, FU money, you know, they, they're just, I mean, that's what these numbers are, are saying to me is like, you're paying Phil Mickelson 200 million plus he's getting all his prize money plus his expenses. Plus he's only having to play in eight events this year, 12 events next year. And then 14, the next two after that, that's the latest that I've heard regarding the I numbers. Think he, 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 even with the deep pockets they had and the enormous amount that they're paying for, I, I don't remember what soccer team or european football team they bought for three or four hundred million i mean they're spending enormous amounts of money obviously they have it and i don't know as many details maybe, maybe somebody's going to post on here and say no you're wrong in this but it, it, from what well, i've read it, it, it's 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 three-year deals right so it seems like a three to five year business plan but i i would have to venture to say that if, if they're not at least have some promise that that they might pull back and say, we're not going to continue to fund this thing at the rate we are. And if that happens, that that's where I think live has some challenges as an upstart, as a business, take away the ethical argument out of it. I just think as a business standpoint, if they're looking at it as a three to five year plan, and if we're still flat or we haven't made nearly the progress that we thought we should, or at least have what we believe to be the potential for this thing to, to be a world renowned or the tour to go to, I think they think twice about it. Well, um, if, if you would have told me, Pete, that all these guys with a jump ship that I'm looking at here that have jump ship, mm -hmm. I would say you're on something. I don't know what they're feeding you at Hilton Head Island. <laughs> but it's in the water. I will tell you this. This is an impressive bunch of players. And oh, I'm the, 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 the word I'm getting from the tour, not to cut you off, but if the next wave that is rumored to be going is really going to be a stomach punch to the, to the tour. And, and I, I'm not going to speculate because I don't want to be the one to – I don't want my friends saying, you didn't mention our name, but you shouldn't have said this. So I'm going to leave what I've heard just as speculation and rumor. But if, if some of those names are true, that's going to be a, a, as big a wow as the, the first group that went over. 
Well, the Matthew Wolf one surprised me. Did, did he did he commit to it? Oh yeah. I knew there was a lot of talk about the it. one uh, Taylor Gooch. He surprised me. Now these got young players that are really good, like Matthew Wolf. I mean, Matthew's not good every week, but he's good, really good enough weeks. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at his action and you're saying, how can this guy possibly make it? You know, week after week, there's no way. Same with Fowler. Fowler is just like, he's all over the place, but when he's good, he's good. Players champion and all this stuff. Fowler brings some huge promise to this tour because he is a, such a well-liked guy. I'm wondering what they're all going to say about him. You know, and again, we, I got off subject a little bit, but when I see everybody drifting to one side of the argument and not even considering personal, you know, either hardship or personal gain that could be done out of this, where whether a guy is basically saying, like Harold Varner, they offered him, I heard, between 30 and 38 million bucks. Love Harold Varner. Love the guy. Such a positive person. I heard that he turned down 38 million, and I'm thinking that may be the stupidest decision ever because <laughs> – in two years, being a non-winner, he could be totally off the tour. And he could be chasing divots or chasing bogeys out on the Corn Ferry Tour or whatever tour. I've seen guys right. go this way. You know who I'd have gone after <laughs> if I were the LIV people? This is no kidding. Harry Higgs. Man, he'd have been right on the oh, deal right there. Yeah. He His is personality. a personality. Yeah. Fun, loving guy. But there's some there's some guys like that out there. You know, I'm looking at a lot of great personalities out there. Um, so I think it's all, you know, up to the players to, you know, get behind this. And the one thing, and I like Jay Monahan. I, I honestly do. I like Rory. I like, you know, Justin Thomas and all these guys. But I see him getting a little bit kind of silly about this. You know, after Rory got his win last week, it's like, you know, I'm glad I have 21 now. More, one more than that other guy who happened to be Greg Norman. Mm-hmm. Well, Rory, do you realize that Greg Norman played six years on the European tour, winning like 50 events over there before he even tried to tee it up over there? No, it makes you look stupid. Well, and then that, that, that's one of the arguments I have is not, I, well, l- l- let me preface what I'm about to say by saying that I think there's two arguments to this live thing. And, and it, one is the ethical side. And, and there can be an argument made for that, and I think they're doubling down on that side. But then the argument that I make to, to many people is it's the, the freedom and the ability for the, for the guys to play where they want to, in particular once they meet. And when I was trying to make it, and I didn't get to the level that you guys did, but it was a 15-tour or 15-event minimum. Correct. And then you were allowed to apply to play for somewhere else. So I, going back to 20-some years ago, that was a, an issue that guys wanted more freedom to be able to play where they wanted to. Yeah. Uh, but I think that the personal attacks by the response of those who are the, the faces of the tour, meaning the Rory's, the Monahans, the Amons, the Brandles, I, I think that it has crossed the line has gone to personal attacks, as you said, without knowing their individual circumstance. But when you bring up the, the ability for them to be able to play where they want to, because the tour for such a long time has had their cake and eaten it too, yeah. where they call them independent contractors, and then they're saying, no, we're not releasing you to go play here. It's like, okay, which one is it? And I think that's, to me, I, my, the tour's response has not been the ethical argument. They, they might go on TV and say it's an ethical thing, but I think behind the scenes that they're, it's a, the competitive part that they're worried about, that maybe they care a little bit about the ethical, but I, I think they're more concerned with the competition and, and what it means to, to what's going to happen to the PGA Tour should this thing continue to grow. They're, they're cherry-picking the ethical side, though. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, at least in their response, whoever's advising them, I, I don't agree with. I, I think the tour could do a lot better job and and win this case in the court of public opinion to a much greater extent than they already are. Well, let let's go to court right now, in this day and age. You know, it's got to be on the side of the workers. You know, I think that the tour is really going to have a challenge on this, uh, you know, monopoly thing or you know, right to work thing. Forever, they've had that 50, you have to play in 15 tour, tour events to maintain the ability to play anywhere overseas. The mm-hmm. players feel like they are owned because if they're offered a huge fee to go play in Zimbabwe or the, the tournament in 
South Africa. That was the million dollar challenge. I don't million think, dollar challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. I mean, they had to get Tim Fincham's blessings or, you know, whatever. And I'm thinking, I remember playing overseas uh, in the British one time and I, and I was going to play in another tournament after that. And they said, uh, you know, you know, I don't know, Mark, I said, what? I'm a middle of the road guy. No, nah, you have to, you know, there, ha- you have to put in the proper application and we're not allowing. I said, man, that, is, that is pretty strong. So I can imagine what the Phil's feel like and the tigers and the John Roms. See, I felt like if, if these guys want to take their 15 events and oh, by the way, the, the majors count as the 15 events. Okay. So it's, it's really 11. It's really 11 and then world golf championships. There's another four there, right? So there's, there's seven left over. You tell me you can't play in the world golf championships, the, the major championships and seven more events. Okay. And then, and then be able to do LIV. I'm saying guys, that's 23 events. You know, let's, let's do that. But the tour is not even giving them that shot. Uh, so I think they ought to work something out. If they don't work something out, I think it's going to be a, a challenge in court. And I, I, you got to know that Bryson DeChambeau is going to say, bring it on. You got to know Phil Mickelson is going to say, bring it on. You got to know DJ. <coughs> DJ is going to take it on. Uh, and Taylor Gooch and Matthew Wolf. This is the new deal. And, and this is why I think the players are even considerate considering this, this move, you know, this is a major sport like football, like baseball, like basketball. We want to be the big guys, right? Okay. Have you ever known a major sport that doesn't pay more than half of its players for teeing it up every week? Could you imagine if Steph Curry didn't get paid when they lost a game? I mean, could you imagine that? Could you imagine any baseball player, you know, half the field doesn't get paid. That would say winners and losers. I know that's incentive to play well, but it's not incentive for hardship. You know, what major sport that you know of, is it football? Is it badminton? I I don't know. Is there a sport that can be called big league sport that doesn't pay all of its participants for doing the interviews for playing the golf, for being entertained. And, you know, I understand those days when the tour maybe wasn't making the money and players, you know, everybody was just scrounging to get by. But obviously the PGA Tour's got money to piss away. And I'm sorry to use it in that term, but they're literally pissing cash away in this PIP thing. The player incentive program, stop yeah, I thought that was it. terrible. Okay? T- terrible idea. Stupid. <laughs> I mean, really. And it's not checkable. You know, it's like, oh, Tiger won. Oh, Phil finished second. Oh, you know, whatever. So, and then they're saying, well, this is confidential. I'm thinking, oh my God, come on guys. So I'm thinking that the PGA Tour is leaving a lot behind closed doors. If, if I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. No I doubt about that's it. That's part of the problem. I, and I, I would say that, I wouldn't say that, that money is not the number one issue they're leaving, because that would be very stupid, I think, on my or anybody's part. They would say that guys are leaving because they want more freedom, that they don't like the over-controlling to to, of the, what the tour is doing, and they have plenty of money to, to do a bunch of other more creative, progressive things right. if they were to just be a little bit more open-minded. But I think that the, the freedom, as we just discussed, and the ability to go do other things is a very, very big part of why a lot of these people are leaving. Um, and I think w- when Phil refers to, you know, now the tour is going to have to make some changes now that this is actually up and going and legitimate. I think that's what he, in my opinion, is referring to. Right. They're, they're going to have to change. They, they, they're, they're, they can't just do what they damn well please anymore, whether right or wrong, whether you believe in what they do or not. But when you when you're I mean, my eyes were open 20 years ago when I heard guys who had had their card. And, and, and you know, if I ran into a Q school and listened to the conversation on the driving range or if I was at a Monday or got in or didn't get in. And hearing the, the veterans back then and then all through the years I played talking about the same thing over and over. And it is, it, it, they're, it is too controlling. They're not allowed to do anything, but they want to be paid or the tour wants to pay them as if they have the ability to do anything. Correct. 
It's it's a one sided coin. Heads I win, and, and that, that's tails what the public doesn't. Yes, that's what the public. I don't think it, that that side of the story has not been brought out there. And if I think if it did, maybe the live players get a little bit more credit. Um, there's a there's a lot to unwrap in this situation. So so just a not a rank and file guy, Pat Perez. Okay, mm -hmm. he signed with them, and he says, "Look, I'm in my middle forties right now. I've been grinding out here for 15, 18 years." He said, I have, I think he says, has one new child or two, two kids. He says, you know, <clears throat> at eight events this year, plus what I've already played in, he said, in the, in the money I'm getting and I'm, I'm getting every expense paid, he says, look, this opens up my life to being somewhat normal. You know, back in my day, I averaged, <laughs> believe it or not, 18 years on the PGA Tour, I averaged 35 weeks a year. 35 weeks a year playing. That's a lot. That's a lot of different hotel rooms where you wake up and look at the ceiling and wonder where you are. And I didn't want to do that. I had to do that. I had to do that to make my money. And then when I got done in October, it took me a minimum of the rest of the time to get my body back in shape, you know, mm -hmm. because of just beating it around. I'd go five, six, seven weeks in a row. And I hear these guys saying these days, Man, I just got off a three in a row stretch. I am beat. <laughs> I say, oh, give me, give me the violin, the smallest violin in the world. And, you know, they they beat up on Sung J M, who's another guy I think ought to go to that tour. They beat up on him for playing 33, 34, 35 events. The year, man, this guy has no life. Well, he likes it so far, but just look at the guys right now. I mean. I look at Fowler, I look at uh, the Shambo, I look at uh, Phil. These guys are all in perfect shape to just say, you know, hey, the next five years, this is great. I look at another guy that doesn't fit any of these molds, Peter Uline. You know, his father is Wally Uline, been a friend of mine for a long time. I played Titleist equipment forever. And um, one of the longest guys at Titleist, you know, and then I, my last few years, I said, hey, guys, I knew my, my days were done. You either got to bump it up. With Titleist, I got to make more money or I got to move. Well, I moved. I moved to a company <laughs> called Lynx Golf. They hate me now, Titleist. But anyway, uh, remember when Fred Couples was using Lynx and uh, uh -huh. Ernie Ells, they were using Lynx? They did it. That was mid-90s. The, they did it for the money. Okay? This was a West Coast company and they were trying to get some traction. So you do that on occasion. I signed for the money. They had a damn good product. They really did. Uh until everybody kept breaking the boom, boom driver, which was Freddie and a couple of things. They said, guys, we just sold like two years worth of boom, boom drivers. And they failed the impact test and keep breaking them. <laughs> it took links out of, out of the ballpark. But, but I'm looking at Peter Uline. Okay. Now this guy's been over in Europe first. He cut his teeth over there with Brooks Kepka, good friends, came over here, had a chance to win several events. Didn't win him. Didn't win. Lost his card. Played over in Europe. Played in that 126 to 150 category. And if I'm not mistaken, he, he's either in that category again or like, I don't know. I don't know exactly what his exact status is. But he's jumping over there. And I think he's maybe 30 years old, 31. And he's still, he's got great game. But he's over there as a non-winner. And I guarantee he's making money. And he finished third last week, $1.5 million, all expenses paid, room, caddy. I think these guys get their caddies paid for, but they have to pay them their percentage, their bonus percentage. Right. Um, so I look at Charles Schwartzel, 36, 37. He's playing the ball I endorse. It's called clear. It's a great ball, by the way. Titleist, don't listen to this, but anyway. <laughs> Big win for Clear Sports. It is literally, if you if you find the ball, play it. It's it's an outstanding golf ball. But Charles Schwartzel wins this thing. And at 36, 37, knowing that he doesn't have a whole lot of, you know, five footers left because he's putting with, you know, any way he can find to get the job done. The guy used to be a great putter. Now he can't putt a lick, you know. Mm -hmm. But he wins that tournament for $4 million. Plus he's probably getting it being a major winner. You're saying – you know, 15 to 25 million, maybe more. Makes sense to me. Lee Westwood, 47, 48 years old. Makes sense to me. 
why he's signing. He's no idiot. He's always signed for the money. Um, and he's made a ton of money, Lee Westwood. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't want to play champions. He doesn't want to play PGA Tour champs. You know, as you talk to people around the globe, it, it, it's be it on social media, you read some things people say, and I've had some guys on from Europe or who are from Europe. Um, the, the European opinion doesn't seem to be as strong anti-live. In fact, it seems to be like, okay, it, it, it doesn't seem to be that bad. I would probably relate that to more Americans are against it, given our history with 9-11 and the emotional connection to that. And I had a discussion with somebody the other day who was was against it. And I said, well, that would to me, that would be the equivalent of someone trying to start J Japan, trying to start a world tour in around 1960, given what happened at, at Pearl Harbor. I said, Correct. so I can I can very much see that that emotional aspect and, and being anti um the, the people who did what they did to this country and being against it. Um, and I, uh, let's see where, oh, but the, the European aspect, it d does not seem to be a, a, as much against it. Uh, the thing that if I was a young player today, a, a t late twenties, thirties, and, and was considering it, I would sit there and wonder if in the three to five years, if this doesn't work out, yes, I have a bunch of money and I don't, I can do whatever I want to, but if they have the passion to play and they know they can play and now they're banned from the, PGA Tour, and, and that's the only place to go, and they control the rest of the tours mostly around the globe. Now they're stuck. So it, it is somewhat of a gamble for them to, to try to make that leap. Is that fair that they're stuck? Shouldn't no, talent, I think I, shouldn't talent yes, be the I overall? The, I, correct. I think that that's the, that's the argument I make. And that would, if, if, if Brandel ever comes on here, that's the argument I would argue back to him to say, shouldn't the players have the right or freedom to go and play where they want to? and not be beholden to one tour. Correct. And so from what I understand in my uh, communication with Greg Norman, uh, just a little back check on me, uh, I played in Australia and I won the Order of Merit back then uh, in 76. They, they did their, their tours from like a certain half of the year. And so I won the Order of Merit in the year 76, 77. <clears throat> that's when they played their tour in the fall and the, and the, and the winter and part of the spring. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I won that order of merit and I got to know Greg Norman very well because he finished second in the order of merit. And let me tell you something. <laughs> I bust his balls whenever I can about that. He said, man, you must've really been good. I said, well, Craig, I think I'm only about 998 million behind you. <laughs> so don't, you know, don't, don't feel bad about it, but I know Greg, Greg is not liked by a lot of people, but he is, I love the guy. I really do. And I can't say I've always loved the guy, but I liked him back then when I met him, when he started playing the tour here, which by the way, was uh, the early eighties. He played a lot in Europe, won a bunch of times over there. And then when he got really good, you know, he kind of divorced himself from a lot of people just because he's Greg Norman. He's a very personal, uh, you know, I guess a personality type, you know, he's a, he's the alpha male and he rubbed people the wrong way. I've always gotten along well with Greg. He's not a mean spirited person. And yet I hear all these personal attacks on Greg Norman. I said, man, if they knew where this guy came from, I mean, the first time I ever saw Greg, we were playing in a tournament in Bateman's Bay, Australia. Okay. And we get out of the bus. There were like 30 of us Americans getting off the bus in a place called Bateman's Bay. And I looked at this guy out on the putting green. I said, who the hell is that? He had long blonde hair, looked like he came off the beach, had a, had a, a body like this from the shoulders down. I said, who in the hell is that? Oh, that's Greg Nolan, mate. He's the best player in all Australia. And I said, well, I've never heard of him, but I have now. And I said, if this guy ever learns how to hit a golf ball, we're all in, we're all in big trouble. And sure enough, we were, he was the needle like tigers, the needle. He was the needle for, I want to say a good a six, eight years. And he and Jack had some great battles and Tom Watson and all these guys. But right oh, now, gosh. yeah, the tour really pissed him off in the nineties because his idea was the world tour. Right. 
And uh, he got bad mouth and trash and all this. You're trying to ruin our tour. You know, three years later, Fincham and his buddies said, hey, let's do this world tour. Guess whose idea that was? So Greg how, just said, okay. How, how much, how much of, of Greg doing what he's doing would you say is either ego driven or, or and maybe vendetta is a strong word, but it's the one that comes to mind now in that he wants that, that the tour took his idea that they, they, they shit on it publicly and then they went ahead and they took his idea and ran with it at the world golf championships. Is any of that sticking in the back of his head that you think as someone who knows him is him saying, this is what I had in mind and you had your chance. I don't think he's being vindictive at all. I think, okay. I know, you know, poison me guys. I mean, Brandle and all you guys, but I, Greg's got bigger fish to fry than BG. I mean, this guy's a worldwide brand. I didn't wear my shark <clears throat> shirt or I didn't eat my Wagyu Greg Norman steak. And I didn't have my bottle of uh, Shiraz that he, he produces over in the Barossa Valley. Um, I like playing his golf courses and this guy's mm -hmm. a worldwide brand. Okay. This is a hobby for him. This is a hobby. This wasn't, this may have been his idea, but he can't fund something like this. Yeah. You know, he never could. He had the idea, Tim Fincham and them ran with it. And I've seen this happen with golf clubs too. Dean Beeman, Dean Beeman admitted this putter. He showed it to a guy. And this guy ripped him off. And it was one of the most popular putters on the planet. And Dean Beeman is still pissed off about that. Well, guess what? The PGA Tour has been doing that kind of thing. And uh, look, the tour is not owned. I don't think golf, that, that was bad to say, the tour is an own. Golf's not owned by any one entity or any one tour. It's a worldwide game. It so happens that the best players in the world are located here and to be recognized as the best player in the world you have to come here in the good old usa i think what the tour is hoping doesn't happen is that someone like rom doesn't go over there and obviously it doesn't sound like rory or or jt are going to go over there because they've been trashing all over greg norman and that tour if i were greg i would never invite those guys but anyway so if they start getting a few more big names, I mean, look, the tour is giving everybody a maximum of a five-year leash. If you win a major championship, you're ex exempt for, you know, five years, right? You win some invitationals, right. you get three years. You get, win most tournaments, you get two years. The rank and file on the PGA Tour are only exempt for one year. Harold Varner, the third. One year. Okay. Mm -hmm. You start thinking about, you start having a wife, you start having a family, start doing all this stuff. Greg knows this. Greg hated going at tour, to tour events for pocket money. When he was the man in Australia, he would demand his appearance money would be the amount of the purse that they were playing for in Australia, New Zealand, wherever that was his demand. And so, same thing with Seve. Seve Ballesteros was the same way. They needed their appearance money. They don't like going to an event, flying their jet there, and losing 20, 30 grand for the week. Okay. So I'm sure that Phil says, this is a great idea. This is what it should have been all along. I don't know if the tour is in a position to pay for those kind of back fees. Uh, but we'll never know. We've never seen the books. I'm quite certain that, uh, you know, there's a lot of charities involved. There's, a, I guess the tour is a 501 C three organization. Mm -hmm. They get no taxes. I mean, you, you start adding up the numbers. So, so this week, conservatively, the USGA conservatively would be making $200 million, 200 million. God knows what the masters makes. They're paying out 12, Point five million. Doesn't take you long to do the math on that. No, and then they call the players who want to jump greedy, which is the ironic thing. There you go. So Greg Norman knows this. He knows the TV numbers. He knows the merchandising numbers. He knows all the numbers. 
because Greg does events. He does a, an event right down the street here at Tiburon called the Shark Shootout. I don't think they'll be calling it the Shark Shootout anymore. <laughs> but um, anyway, look, guys, turn over the other side of the coin. Take a look at it. If you were one of these players, would you – look, it's hard to – it's hard to go around the world, but it's it's turning into that right now. We had a match play event in Australia, for God's sake. We do the President's Cup over, you know, all parts of the world. Those are fun events. I think the players now, the world is so small that they're saying, hey, I've got three events in America. I've got Pumpkin Ridge. I've got Doral, by the way. There's another one for you. And Bedminster. Two of those three courses are Donald Trump courses. They took two events away from Donald Trump just because he's a conservative. Right. How about that one? How about that one? Donald Trump has done more for this game of golf. He's taken old beat up places. Doral would have gone bust. Okay. Not, not anymore. And the Cadillac tournament is there. And because of Donald Trump's politics or whatever, they say, yeah, let's go play in Mexico. So they shafted Donald Trump there. The PGA Wait, shafted the Donald Trump and his people. At bed, which is the bun- biggest bunch of hi- hypocrisy that you're going to take it away from Trump because whatever they want to say that he said, but you're going to go to a country and th- this would be an argument against Randall. He's arguing the Khashoggi thing, but you're going to go to a country that, that 3000 journalists a year disappear because the government or whoever doesn't agree with what they write. It's like, uh, how, how does two and two is equal in 10 on this one? Yeah, it's like th- there's nothing in, in, in your reasoning and where you're going that, that add up, N- not one little thing but what they profess is the complete opposite that that and that's the other issue i have another event and it goes deeper than this it goes deeper than doral and in uh, bedminster which is a hell of a golf course i heard troon is now out of the rota rota in the british mm-hmm. open because donald trump took over troon so it's officially out of the rota that just it just blows me away just absolutely blows me away. So anyway, um, when they start playing in these great venues, and I have a feeling, you know, the next year when the LIV tour is expanded, you know, Pumpkin Ridge is great. And so if I'm a guy like Peter Uline, I live in America, I'm saying, hey, I've got three events and, you know, in America, I've got one in London. That ain't so bad. I've got to play in three in Saudi Arabia and I can go to Australia. I have a feeling they'll be playing some really great venues. Greg, Greg is very positively thought of around the world. Okay. He really is. And I think this is the worst place for him right now because of all, it's like being on a ship. If you're a conservative and you're, and you're on a ship, one of these Royal Caribbean cruises or carnival or whatever cruise you're on, all you're seeing is CNN. That's the one thing I hate about the cruises. All I get to watch is CNN. I don't get to watch any conservative TV at all when I'm on the road in that in that way. So we are listening to beating down, beating down Greg Norman, not taking the other side of the planet. OK, we, we've got to take we've got to look at both sides on this thing. Yeah, it's going to stop the PGA Tour as we know it. How bad is it going to be that void that is lost from our players going over there. And I say our players, they're not our players. They're the tours players. They claim they can't do anything without the blessing of the PGA tour. I don't think that's the way America's run right now. I think, no, I think if more people knew that, that, then the perspective, you would see more of the other side of the coin. Um, Yeah, but it's very unpopular to take that view. That's, that's, I think one of the issues that got me fired from Sirius XM being on PGA tour radio for seven years. And, and that's about it. I think there's a lack of leadership around in everything right now. And that if, if you're in a leadership position, whether it's as an individual or an entity, let's say a board, the PJ tour has their board as most corporations or committees or things like that. When you're in that position, you're supposed to be the one who's looking at all the variables from both sides of the coin, listen to both arguments and then make your deductions and decisions based off the information from both parties. It doesn't seem like in, in today's, mainstream world that's happening in much of anything anymore and and that's where i think there's a breakdown i also think there's a breakdown in in something like this where live tour is is new and it's competing and it's changing the dynamic of the golfing world that that the lines aren't drawn and i 
for anything. It's like, what's the rules and who gets to draw those lines and make those? Because as I alluded to, the, the, the emotional impact for someone from this country is different from, say, somebody from South Africa. So it, I, would, I, ask, I would ask players being a, a more of a neutral person on a podcast or a host of a podcast is what, where, where does a line get drawn for a U.S. player? Like if you were still playing, where, where does a line get drawn for you as somebody, a U.S. citizen, between the ethical component and the financial component? <laughs> well, I guarantee if Nike had paid me a bunch of money to wear their stuff, I, would it bother me that the Uyghurs are getting killed over in, in China and, mm -hmm. and, and the Chinese, you know, we're getting a lot of our goods, our golfing goods from China. Um, I mean, half the, the stuff you buy in Walmart is from China. Right. I don't look at it as, can I really make a change? Can I, can I cause a change to what they're doing in Saudi Arabia by not playing or would it be a positive change? The other thing? I would, I would take politics out of it. I would take, um, human elements out of it. And I would have to play. Why am I playing golf? Number one, you start out because you love the game. Pete, you know, we love the game. It's a crazy game. It gets into your heart. And you'd say, man, as a, as a kid going to high school and college, I would do anything to play this game for a living. Then you get out there and you say, man, I would do anything to be able to stay out here and make a living. Okay. Right. It becomes making a living. Then you get to that upper echelon and say, hmm, wow, this is really good. You know, this is great. Now you want to hang on to it. You want to hang on to it. You want to make it as good for you as absolutely possible because you know that your time horizon is going to be limited. Now, look, I played a lot of practice rounds with Tom Watson. He went to school at Stanford. I went to school at San Jose State. He's five or six years older than me, and I love Tom Watson. But he made the statement one time. I, he and I were in the airport you know, waiting for a flight or something like this, and, and I said, Tom, I saw what you wrote the other day or, you know, you were quoted as saying that, you know, anyone past 80th on the money list can't play a lick and that the tour ought to be shut down to the top 70 players or something like that. And uh, he said, yeah, I honestly feel that way. He says, how are you doing this year? I said, I'm in about 90th spot right now. <laughs> you know, so Tom, I don't, I don't agree with that. Okay. Well, about four or five years later, I looked at Tom Watson standing on the money list and it was 88. So things change, you know, depending on who you are. And I think that Phil Mickelson, he would love to be playing over here, but he'd like to be paid. You know, he doesn't want to have to make cuts anymore. I don't blame him. It ain't easy. Look, look at the U S open, but he was value out there. You're telling me that he didn't turn some eyeballs. Everyone was looking, where's Phil? Tiger's not playing this week. Where's DJ? As a golf commentator slash player and radio announcer, I would say that, look, I would normally have my eyes glued onto the TV set and be watching the U.S. Open. Not, not today. I would pay to have the LIV tour on my air right now just because it's different. It's a place I haven't seen before. I want, to see, I want to see Pumpkin Ridge. I want to see yeah. Bedminster. I want to see Doral. I want to see Doral back. And they canceled Doral to go to freaking Mexico? Give me a break. And I, I'm Latino. Okay, I don't look Latino, but I'm, I'm half Latino, all right? Mm -hmm. so, so I'm not saying anything racially. I'm just saying you want to go from Miami to downtown Mexico, play Chapultepec down there? It's a, it's a, it's a dump. You know, you want to go through that smog every day to get. So, so that's what we lost. We lost that event because somebody made the decision. That's where we're going, you know? And I, I'm thinking, well, did the players have any say? Doral's been on our talk about loyalty and talk about going for the money. Since the sixties. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was the like Eastern airlines the open and then it was a Delta open and then it was a rider championship. And then it was a Cadillac championship mm -hmm. and they left for the money. So it's pretty hypocritical for, you know, Fincham and, or, you know, Jay and these guys who jumped for the money. That's what they did. They took it from a bona fide American PGA tour event. And they brought those dollars right over to Mexico city. And I've got that, nothing against Mexico city, you know, 
that, 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 that's the argument. As I split it into two, and I said there's an emotional or ethical component, and then there's the competitive financial components. And I brought up to a lot of people, I said, if you go back to the 80s, when Seve was coming up, Faldo was coming, not even coming up, but they were already established in Europe, and they were coming over here, but they were getting appearance money over there, and then there was an argument about they can't have tour membership because they're not meeting the criteria. It's like, well, the PGA Tour was siphoning off the best players in Europe to bring them over here. Why is what someone – now is someone doing that to them? Why is that such a bad thing? And, and that, that's where I, I want to hear the competitive, the competition market argument is like, why can one do it? And then when someone does it to them, it, it's horrendous. It's called survival. You know, it's okay if the tour does it, but it's not okay if the DP tour does it. Right. Look, Rory at one time was a DP tour player, the Euro European mm -hmm. tour player. You don't think it hurt them to lose him? But he said, Huge. you know, he said, oh, bon voyage, European tour. Your courses aren't hard enough. I'm shooting, you know, you got to shoot 2,500 to win. The purses aren't as good. Guess what, Rory? You left for the money. And that hurt the European tour a lot more than it helped the, U, the, the PGA tour. Okay? Right. It was a dagger in the heart of the European tour. All right? Now, did Europe say to Rory, Rory, if you leave today, we will never let you come back? No, they didn't do that. But that is, in essence, what the PGA tour is doing. And you have to look at it from both both sides. And I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this is a chance for the DP Tour to get it back. If they don't cancel Odegay from playing, if they don't cancel uh, Lin, uh, Cantor, Laurie Cantor, if they don't ban Wiesberger, if they don't ban Scott Vincent, Sam Horsfield, Pablo Larasabal, they're going to play back in Europe, the DP Tour. Once, you know, they've got eight play, eight tournaments to play in the LIV. Now, do you welcome them back with open arms if you're the European Tour? You're damn right you do. However, the PGA Tour is now linked with, in some way, the DP World Tour. Because we're having three events that are conjoined. We're having the, uh, the tournament in Reno. Forget the name of it. <laughs> uh, that's terrible of me to forget the name of it. Barbasol. There's one in Alabama. And then there's the, um, I want to say it's a Scottish Open on their side. So our players can intermingle. Barracuda Championship. Sorry for all you Reno fans. Uh, so it's the Barracuda. I think it's the Barbasol. It could be another event. Uh, and the event in uh, England or the UK would be the 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 Scottish Open. So our players can go over there without releases. Their players can come over here without releases because they're kind of like um, world tour events, but at a smaller scale. So now does that put that in jeopardy, uh, that alliance, in case, you know, Europe decides to not fire their players for going to LIV? Yeah, it's this is an interesting soap opera. <laughs> I mean, I hate to, you know, some people look not down at it, but uh, saga, let, let me call it a saga. You know, I'm, I've been watching Game of Thrones. I'm very late to that game, of course. But this is like watching something that's eight seasons long, 10, epi 10 episodes per season. And it's like this thing's going to continue to to grow and grow and grow and, and be the focus of golf discussion, I think, for quite some time. It is this it's not going to end next week or next month. It is. Um, this is something it's 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 pretty deep out there and I, I think it's right to work i honestly do and there's going to be people that just are going to hate ricky fowler <laughs> they're going to be people that hate dustin johnson forever uh people already hate phil but man if they all hate phil that loved phil just a year ago that's a lot of fans out there you're going to hate jason kokrak forever i love jason kokrak he looks like shrek to me you know he's just a big <laughs> a big ogre and a great player and in, in, in his, you know, 33, 34 years old, he's saying, I'm done after this. This guy came up from nowhere. He was, I met him first on the E tour in the Carolinas or Florida or something like that. He came out to a corn Ferry tour and he won that sucker. And I said, Holy crap. Where did this guy come from? He drove that ball. He putted that ball. He had the lead the whole week. I said, 
that just shows you how hard it is to get on the PGA tour. It's extreme. It's not getting any easier and it's hard to stay. So that's why I think it's like, where am I going to play? You know? So Harold Varner, a, a caddy named Dan McQuilkin, he caddied for me. We call him the punk. He worked for, um, Lauren Roberts in his days on the PGA tour. He worked for me a little bit. He's worked for a bunch of good, really good players. And, uh, I saw a tweet that he said, you know, Harold Varner, if he doesn't take 38 million, he's nuts. He said he could be out, uh, uh, with the range ball picker in two years. And that's the truth. You can, you can play well. Ask a guy named Steve Marino. Steve Marino was a very good player and still is a good player. He plays in many tour events in the East coast of Florida right now. Steve Marino was like one of the best players to not win. He had a bad year one year and he hasn't been back out there. He's playing the crap yeah, he tours. Was top 10, he top 10 every week. It seemed like for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden gone. gone. That's how fickle this game is. So if I'm Harold Varner, I said, yeah, and I like records and all that stuff, but I think I like the game and playing the game more than I like records. When you come out on that tour, you're not thinking of records unless you're a John Rahm or a Justin Thomas or, you know, Jordan Spieth or even a Matthew Wolf or even Colin Murakawa. Maybe you're thinking records now, but until you get established, you're thinking about just holding on. It, 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 as we're winding down on time, and I, I know you've got to run soon, but as, as someone who experienced cancel culture in, in your media career on a couple of number of occasions, do, do you think it's, it's the ridicule of these players is getting borderline or close to trying to cancel them for something that they don't might not agree with? Yeah, they've already tried to cancel Phil, you know, and I think they're in their way trying to explain away DJ. Well, he's old and he's, you know, he's not doing this anymore. And, you know, he's tired, you know, and he's not winning at another at the highest level anymore. I'm thinking, are you guys nuts? Uh, yeah, they're the they're going to three and four in a row just a couple of years ago. <laughs> and all of a sudden, two, two years later, he's too old. Yeah. Come on. Um, so uh, Mark O'Meara won two majors when he's 41 years old. Mm-hmm. Jack won a major when he was 46. I think DJ's in a little bit better shape than Jack was. Okay. So, yeah, they just want to poo-poo this because it doesn't line up with them. So I think they're trying to cancel. Look, anyone that doesn't show your values, um, uh, you know, they can get you canceled. The Twitter thing is just pathetic. I mean, my friend Hank Haney got, he got canceled by PGA Tour Radio because he, he was outspoken against, against the LPGA Tour. I mean, he made a comment about uh, who do you think is going to win uh, this week in the LPGA at the LPGA Open, he says, I don't know, one of the uh, Lee Six or some, one of the Lee sisters, there's six of them out there. He says, I'll take, I'll take Lee Six. I don't give a rat's butt about the LPGA. Man, I'll tell you what, Michelle, we tweeted something out. It caught fire and Hank Haney was canceled. He was the best money maker on Sirius XM radio. This guy got canceled so quick. I listened to that radio for two days and they, and TV shows, they beat this guy to shreds. Okay. And this guy is a good guy. Okay. Yeah. They took that way out of context. He was making the point from what I remember that so- someone of, of Asian descent was going to win that week because they were dominating the women's tour. That's essentially what he was saying. And they twisted it to sound like he was some sort of against like, women, anti-Asian against women. And it's like, that's not what he said at all. It's not, but if they paraphrase it, if they take a little segment out of it and they throw it on Twitter, boom, that's exactly what they did to me. I made a, uh, an improper comparison between a winning ladies league, which is the LPGA tour, which my wife and my daughter were out watching that day to a failing league, which was the WNBA. And I said, you know, my wife and daughter out at the LPGA week, you know, event, the drive on championship up at Crown Colony. And I said, man, I'm really proud of what they've done the last 10 years. I never used to follow them 10 years ago. I thought it was dead. Now they've picked it up. And then I made a little bit of a comparison error. And I said, now the comparison to that is a league that is failing. And I said, I watched the WNBA highlights this morning on ESPN. And I said, you'd have to put a gun to my head before I'd, you'd make me watch that. <laughs> and I'm telling you, everybody laughed. Everybody in the studio laughed. 
my two compatriots, Dave Marr and Craig Can, who is a good friend of mine. Both of these guys I worked with at Golf Channel. I said, was that okay? They said, oh yeah, that was funny. That was, that was too funny, man. You, only you could say it the way you said it. Well, guess what? Some female jock or whatever put a very intimate, uh, a very select snippet out, put it on Twitter. And man, I was done so fast. It wasn't even funny. Within five hours, they had me done. And I went to my yeah, producers. That's... It's amazing. And I just said, I, I don't look at Twitter, but if you guys are making a decision on who works for this network based on what a Twitter account has, God help you. And I think that's what's going on with the PGA Tour. They're trying to get, I mean, even Justin Thomas is tweeting something out about his friend Rory winning one more time than uh, Greg Norman. That just... It just rubs me the wrong way, but he knows he'll get traction because he's got what 10, 20,000 users. But um, you can get canceled at any time. The message. Huh? Right. It's how they're controlling the message. It's how they're controlling the message. It, they offer it, the bonuses for it. Exactly. And then they get the following, and then now they're beholden to whatever entity put that bonus up for them. And now that now that I, I've seen this enough to, to know the fundamental and the model. Now they start saying, "Hey, can you drip this out? Can you help our organization?" Can Correct. You You're part of the organization. We they're gonna they're gonna use their um, uh, morals and and, and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, that that they're, that, that, that they're part of that group ethics, and they're gonna use all those things to to, to utilize that platform and say, hey, "We helped you develop this. We gave you the, the bonuses to do it. We need your help in return." and putting our message out there. And usually they gladly put it out there because they're part of that organization. But that as the whole of humanity or the sport or whatever you want to put at the top of that, does that work to the benefit of the whole? And I'm, I, I, it might, but I'm not seeing it. The reason, well, people, I worked for 18 years on the Golf Channel and uh, I never got reprimanded or anything until one day I came out with a tweet that was somewhat offensive. And then that started my downhill slightness, man, you guys wanted me to get on Twitter. You know, me, you know, you wanted me to get on this thing and now you're beating me up over it. And the thing that bothers me is that to stand out, you know, the, these guys on golf channel. And I love, I love that place. I, you know, I met my wife there and I have two beautiful kids and, and I love golf channel and Joe Gibbs and all these people that started it. Arnold Palmer was a dear friend. You know, it just gets, to where everything else does. It's fun for a while. And then all of a sudden it gets political. And, uh, that's where I always told myself the minute it starts getting political, I don't want to be involved. So, uh, I think the first 12 years at golf channel of my 18 were really, really good. We weren't put the muzzle didn't get put on, but then once we got taken over by I don't know, Comcast a hundred percent. And then, and then we took on uh, NBC. Now we're part of the NBC family. Oh my gosh. They believe me, Brandel and Eamon Lynch are definitely being dictated to. Okay. Now they're muzzling them. And uh, so they know which side of their bed is bread is buttered, but I would never go that way. Never. I would say, if you don't want me to talk about that, don't bring it up to me. Okay, lie, you're out of the segment. Great. Fine. Because I don't want to, I don't want to be involved because I know I'm going to say something against the grain. Same thing with Sirius XM. They hired me because I'm different. Okay. And I don't go with the flow. I'm not, I'm not, you know, whatever way the wind's blowing. Let me see. This, this is what they're all thinking. I think I'll go this way. I have my own ideas. And uh, when they told us at Sirius XM, because we're basically supported by PGA Tour, they said, you can't, you can't say what a, you know, you can't go on the other side of this issue on the LIV. And I just said, guys, are we the golf? You know, we're the PGA Tour radio. I said, man, this is not looking good. And sure enough, there it was. Bingo. Made it very and, easy, and, and, convenient know, for them. And fundamentally it goes against what golf is all about and what they've always pushed it. But it's like, you're out there like, okay, Rory, somebody has been pushing on, I don't know who it was, but Rory had a 
comment the, after his interview, I think yesterday, about, look, I want other, the competition to be playing as best they can because then it pushes me to play as good as I can, right? It pushes me to be a better golfer. Um, it, in, it increases competition, increases the sport viewership. It's great for the game, et cetera. But why doesn't that they, – they want that from the players, but why don't they hold themselves to the same standard and say, oh, live, live golf is out there, it's obviously legit, and we – welcome the competition because we know that we have the better product and we know that we're going to do a lot better thing and we're better for the game and, and the whole litany of things that they put out there. But I don't understand why they want the players to say it, but they don't want to be beholden to the same rules, guidelines, ethics, whatever you want to fill in the blank, the way that they want the players to. And it's like, come on, guys, you, you, you do everything. Your entire organization and tournaments are based off competition and accepting it and becoming better. Why are you not following the same – guidelines why don't you adhere to the same thing well for 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 instance this one and i'm just going to divert a little bit because it makes sense they're saying if i hear that liv is growing the game one more time i'm going to scream in what way does liv grow the game here's what it does people in oregon are starving for golf okay they used to have the fred meyer challenge there every year mm -hmm. okay no golf in Oregon, period. Nothing. The, the Northwest gets zero golf. They get a Champions Tour event at Snoqualmie Ridge, a TPC up there. That's it. People are starving for golf. So now we've got three markets that it's going to. we got it going to New Jersey, which is Bedminster, okay, which is not quite starving for golf. I think this is going to be a great tournament. Pumpkin Ridge, which only hosted, you know, an LPGA Open and a, a, I think a, a U.S. Amateur. People in Oregon, that's how it grows the game. And then Doral, which got vacated, uh, you know, and it got destroyed. It got bombed. And uh, so now it's going back to Doral. And then there's golf in London. And then there's going to be golf in other places that people can get out and watch golf. That's how it grows the game. And they're going to see people from all over the world, from Zimbabwe, from South Africa, from uh, Canada, from Japan, from uh, Australia. They're going to see all this golf from Germany, uh, you name it, from Austra uh, um, Austria, Bernd Wiesberger. All What's going to happen to the Ryder Cup? What's going to happen to the President's Cup? All these guys that are going to be persona non grata at these events, if they're LIV players, we got half our half our team uh, on both sides on the President's Cup this year <laughs> are not going to be able to play. Louis Oosthuizen. So, mm -hmm. how's that? I mean, that's basically killing the game. I think. I think it's killing the game by not letting these guys play. Just my opinion. And it, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this pans out. Yeah. So, you know, got the was it the Pre President's Cup this year? So President's like, Cup this year, yeah. It's going to be in North America. It's going to be at Charlotte at uh, Quail Hollow. Quail Hollow. Yeah, which is a big boy golf course. Mm -hmm. Get ready to pull some head covers off that week, baby. <laughs> so, and and if, if more people are jumping to live, that's going to play a huge role in who who's making the team and who's not. So, it, that's going to be another road stop or or to see, hey. Which direction did this go? How much influence did Liv have over it? And how, what did the PGA Tour do in response? I mean, if they're, if they're going 40, 50 places down the money list, which I don't think they will, just to exaggerate the example, to, to fill teams on both sides, it's like how much viewership are they going to get for that? And, or is it going to take a hit? Is, it going to, is, is the event itself going to draw enough people in? And it, Now, if it's exciting – then may, maybe it's okay, but it, it, I think people turn tune in to watch the superstars more so than they turn into the event. Well, there's also this to consider: uh, world golf ranking points. Mm -hmm. uh, they they could possibly have better fields at LIV than um, in a, a certain PGA Tour event or twelve. You know, how do you just ignore? what Bryson DeChambeau and Patrick Reed and, and DJ are doing and some of the great players from overseas. How are you going to ignore that? Like it never happened. That's the thing that bothers me. And, and to see it on YouTube was like uh, the LIV tournament on YouTube. 
that was crazy. I mean, I was watching, I said, this is crazy that somebody is not, is not handling this, uh, more substantial because the first show was pretty enticing was to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I see somebody jumping ship. I mean, what are they got a thousand channels out there? Somebody's going to put it out there <laughs> where it's going to be sure a national thing. Worked on. If they called you up tomorrow and said, Mark, we want you to be an announcer for live. Do, do, do you go? <sighs> I think I'm done traveling, <laughs> to be honest with you. I would stay here in America, and I would be honored to do those. But I, I don't know. I might, I might go as far as London, but going to Australia and going to some of the other places, I, I don't think so. I would love to do you, half a dozen. You had enough traveling in your career? Look, I did, I did 38 to 40 weeks of travel a year for 36 years. <laughs> God bless you. So I look it too, don't I? But yeah, you do you not look your age. I can cause me not cause me to wear yeah, these. You gotta keep the glasses. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, I I I've kept you past a lot of time you, you said you give me. Um I very much appreciate it. And as this progresses, I'd love to have you back on it if if that's okay. I would love to if it you know, I'm I'm surprised the PGA tour hasn't shut you down right now. But uh look, I've I've always liked the contrary opinion. It's not that I agree with either side. I think I'm, I tried to explain it like this. I'm not for or against the LIV tour. Okay. I want to stay kind of level, but what I am against that overshadows all of this is the right for the PGA tour player, a uh, PGA tour to cancel any of their past players like DJ and DeChambeau and Phil and Fowler. And any of the European guys, Oosthuizen, Westwood, Schwartzel, you know, Jason Kokrak, Taylor Gooch, Matthew Wolf. If that, if that doesn't say enough to you right there, how, what do they do? It's not fair. And so that's, that's where I'm the most outspoken of is, is that there's got to be something done that allows them to play on other tours at any time they yep. want. I would agree. It's been great. Um, Thanks. Stay on just for a few minutes sure. after we, we're done with this. And uh, I, I'm sure everybody's going to love checking this one out.